we're going to talk about implementing intelligence. We've had a lot of talk about various facets of things, but I really like to stick with or focus on the so what. What is it that we're trying to achieve through intelligence practices and intelligence research? So with that said, currently I am doing threat intelli things for Huntress uh, and have been for about two weeks now. Previously, I was running detection engineering and threat intel for Gigamon and had various stops in the CTI world at uh, Domain Tools, Dragos, uh, did incident response at Los Alamos National Laboratory for a few years and then did various things in the US Navy. But we don't really care about that. What we really care about is on the next slide. There we go, our agenda. We're gonna start out by defining intelligence because you know what? We haven't talked about that today yet. Uh, might seem like we're at a cyber threat intelligence co uh, conference, right? Everyone knows what intelligence is and we agree on that response, right? Well, as Chris pointed out in his keynote, looking at our definition of things and our agreement or lack thereof can be very important in trying to understand just where we're going and what it is that we're speaking about. Once we're settled on a definition, or at least my working definition for threat intelligence for this discussion, we'll then move into how intelligence gets applied and then transition into a discussion on detections and then conclude with an intelligence-driven approach to detection development and engineering. So with that, let's define intelligence, right? Because this is simple. So what is intelligence? Uh, that's a little small, I guess, for the folks in the back, my apologies. But uh, you know, intelligence means a lot of different things or whatever. You could have your you know, pseudo Jack Ryan or whatever persona, James Bond stuff or whatever. And the TPS report in the lower right is kind of what you actually do, or at least it feels that way sometimes. You know, intelligence, it's about coming up with indicators, sharing them and writing reports and stuff, right? Well, not really. That would kind of suck, wouldn't it? Uh, so really what I like to look at when it comes to intelligence is viewing intelligence as decision support because stakeholders, whoever our audience is that drives the need for a CTI program, they need to make decisions. And the problem is, that in almost all cases, the, those decisions are made with incomplete or imperfect information. So intelligence can step in to reduce, but not eliminate that uncertainty. And that can go from business intelligence to threat intelligence, to more classic sort of uh, government uh, intelligence program work and so forth. But the idea being is that whether it is some general on the battlefield to an executive in the boardroom to Jimmy the SOC analyst who's working the third shift or whatever and has an alert come up that their decision when it comes to what is facing them at that moment is improved by the information that we can provide as an intelligence product of some sort. So in looking at that, we can break decision making down effectively into two areas. Uh, there was a previous presentation that threw an operational and operational always seems like it messes people up. So we'll just skip that one for now. Uh, but we have very tactical decisions that can look into specific adversary actions, as well as the countermeasures and responses to those uh, adversary actions, making for very tactical decisions, as well as strategic decisions that get into higher level investment and in planning, as well as discussions like risk evaluation and tolerance, which are discussions that no one wants to have because those are boring, but important. Uh, we're going to focus on the upper part here of tactical decision making for the purpose of this presentation, because we're talking about a very tactical subject of detection development and detection deployment. So with that said, how do we then start applying this decision support in a way that matters in a tactical, very tactile, to use a little bit of alliteration here, fashion? Well, we can look at our intelligence cycle, right? Tells us where this gets applied. It gets applied right there, dissemination and integration, right? And we've had a couple of discussions so far in the conference about how this sharing out or uh, getting information in the hands of stakeholders can work. But the thing is, is that just like none of us are probably gonna have the same definition for intelligence, pretty sure very few of us are going to have a very similar or common idea of what it means to disseminate and integrate intelligence into operations. Because when we start talking about dissemination and integration, what the hell does that look like? I don't know, could it be reports? Yeah, I mean, it kind of sucks. I mean, uh, you know, reports are good. I've, read, I've written a lot of reports in my day and they certainly communicate a lot of information, but they take a while to put together. They take a while to read. And so we have to ask ourselves from a integration and dissemination standpoint, if I'm looking at this from a very tactical perspective, how am I getting this information out quickly enough to matter? And that is suitable enough for stakeholders to ingest that they can use this to improve decision-making. So reports, they have their use. 
maybe not quite what we're looking for here. What about IOCs? Well, in addition to the fact that it, people don't understand IOCs very well, I'll die on that hill. Um, you know, everyone wants to talk about the problem with indicators, like, oh, they're atomic, they go stale very easily, they are very situationally dependent. Uh, you know, the thing is that indicators can be pretty damn useful, though, too, especially if you're talking about very immediate support to immediate security outcomes. So like, hey, this IP bad. Like, okay, that makes a decision pretty damn easy in that case until it's 8.8.8.8, and then you piss someone off. Um, indicators, we could have a whole other presentation. I have a whole other presentation on indicators. It is a thing that we can do. It probably isn't the thing that we can do because there are problems with this in terms of execution as well as understanding. So what else can we look at? I think I want a contest with this slide. I'm pretty sure this hasn't made it in any presentation so far today. Yeah, what's up, Dave? Uh, so we could talk about behaviors. We look at the pyramid of pain, right? Like, yeah, TTPs, like what the hell are those? No one really has an idea of what that means either, let alone how do you translate TTPs into something actionable? You know, at the end of the day, TTPs most of the time seem like they just end up as a slightly shorter report that doesn't really have a good way of getting ingested into some sort of tool or uh, decision-making cycle to make a difference. So yeah, behavior is again, pretty cool. But if I'm talking about supporting tactical decision-making in the soccer and IR engagement, what am I really doing here that's operating at the speed that I need as well as providing the sort of utility for people to take action? Well, there's another option that we haven't discussed yet. And that kind of gets into encoding some of these TTPs in a way, and that would be catching adversaries. And we have a lot of frameworks that we could use in order to do so. We have Sigma, Yara, Zeek, Suricata, Snort, if you haven't been doing, updating things in a while, I guess. Uh, that was a little mean. Um, but uh, you know, we have a lot of detection languages or alerting languages that we can use, some of which can be very powerful depending upon how they're used or how they're sequenced. Now we start getting into an area where we're providing something that has direct benefit to responders, to analysts who are sitting doing security operations, but moving kind of into a realm where I think most people in this room might be a little uncomfortable in writing, maybe not so much a Yara signature because we're so damn dependent on things like retro hunts and so forth and virus total for those of us who could afford it. Uh, but you know, certainly in other realms such as Sigma development, Zeek scripting, not something that you see too many intelligence analysts do, at least not in my experience, but maybe we should question whether or not we need to start encompassing knowledge of these disciplines into the intelligence framework to try to understand ways that we can begin applying intelligence in an operational capacity. Because again, what are we trying to do here? Improve decision-making to enhance security outcomes. If I'm talking about tactical decision-making, that means reduce my mean time to detect, uh, mean time to respond goes down as well, allowing for remediation of incidents and so forth. And that means identifying these things in the first place. Uh, you know, certainly, again, we can have a whole conversation about threat hunting to find the things that we miss, but damn it, wouldn't it be nice if we didn't miss them in the first place because we were using a refined intelligence process in order to fuel our security program? Well, what does that look like then? The detections. We've had some languages that we talked about that look detection-y, uh, I suppose, but what does this look like in practice? So really, if we want to take a fairly simplistic definition of detections, we're really looking at the identification of threats within a monitored environment via an automated or semi-autonomous logic or framework. So using something like a Zeek script or a Yara signature or a Sigma signature um, informed by an understanding of what adversaries are doing or behaviors that we're curious about or concerned about, in order to codify that into some language that allows us to then observe these things when they manifest in the network that we're trying to defend. So in looking at this as part of our security workflow, and again, this is very simplified, maybe that's a good thing, and perhaps our workflows are a little more complicated than they need to be, we want to identify observables, indicators, or behaviors of interest within the, the environment that we're defending. To do so, we try to set alerts or alarms around those items of interest, and then when they manifest, we want to respond to those items in the monitored environment. There's a lot of different disciplines that come into here, and we can certainly get into discussions on things like incident support, playbook development, and other items, which could be very valuable discussions themselves. But for now, because we only have 19 minutes and 46 seconds, we're going to talk detections. Uh, 
And in looking at this, we can have an example. I mean, it helps to have an example of something, right? And this is actually a pretty simple one. And honestly, it's something that you should probably implement in your own environment if you haven't done so already. Identify instances where you have an SSL T or TLS communication that uses an X509 certificate containing the default interpreter uh, criteria. That's pretty stupid simple. As long as you're capturing X509s in the wire, which you know certain developments and stupid privacy or whatever is gonna make that go away in a couple of years. But anyway, for now, this is a very valid way of trying to identify that, hey, I have a you know someone who's lazy, stupid, or just doesn't care that is launching a interpreter instance in my network using HTTPS or a uh, encrypted channel. Okay, why is this simple? It's simple because it's a sim single observation. I only have to get one thing, carve that X509 out of the wire or uh, capture the X509 as part of the TLS handshake. It has a very tight correlation to malicious activity. You, know, you could say like, oh, you're gonna catch a red team. You're like, yeah, that's malicious activity. The behavior is bad. I don't care that you know it's a benign event or whatever. It's like, fine, benign, true, positive, call it whatever the hell you want. But this is capturing something with a very high signal to noise ratio and it only needs one data source. So as you're doing any sort of network monitoring, you probably can implement this in your environment right now in a way that's not terribly costly and that could be very cost effective given the signal to noise ratio on the given item in question. The thing is though, is that not always that easy. Uh, adversaries aren't always lazy, unfortunately, although you'd be surprised how many are. And so we have to get a little bit more complex. So for example, another thing that I would recommend you try to implement in your environment, but probably is going to be significantly more difficult to do so is identify portable executable files or bi binary files downloaded from previously un unknown or unobserved network infrastructure that contain one or more uh, function imports matching a list of items of interest, say encryption function. So you are looking at likely ransomware samples. That's freaking hard because uh, we're talking about a number of things that need to come together in building this detection in order to make it functional. Certainly it's informed by an understanding of what threat actors do, post post-exploitation binaries and network space that they own that we probably don't interact with all that often, downloading them and then executing them in order to kick off a ransomware incident or something else. But this gets pretty complex because we're talking about multiple observations and doing so in a way that's chained or sequenced, looking for the individual events, none of which are necessarily malicious or even necessarily suspicious on their own, such as downloaded a binary file, did so from a previously unobserved network space, and the binary contains some functionality that could be a little snarky. It's only when we put all of this together that we get something that is really worth investigating. And we also have to worry that at this stage, we're probably getting into a realm where we're capturing some legitimate activity. So for example, if we change this instead of uh, containing encryption functions to say, uh, downloading to and executing out of app data local temp. Okay, that probably is going to cap capture some stagers. You're also going to capture like Chrome installers. Um, so you know, we have to wonder how rigorous, how effective is the signature logic in, within our detection relative to adversary activity and how much information are we providing to the analyst so that they can make a solid and uh, probably quick disposition as to whether or not this is worth escalating, further investigating, or declaring as a benign uh, and false positive event. And this very correlation between data sources, while incredibly powerful, anyone who's tried to do things like join tables and whatnot in a Splunk, Elk, or whatever, like not only is the syntax not necessarily straightforward, but that gets very expensive very quickly and just very hard to do. Um, so yeah, this is good, it's also probably not where a lot of folks are right now, but this is also important to understand from a intelligence development perspective of what are the capabilities or the possibilities available to me or available rather to my stakeholders so I know what to communicate to them. I know what languages they speak. I know what tools they have. I know what's relevant to their operations and what's simply out of bounds right now. So we can read papers about four types of detection or uh, how important detecting behaviors are or doing stateful detection engineering. But if your SOC can't do it, then what the heck's the point of trying to integrate that into your operations outside of just trying to sell your decision makers that, hey, we need to maybe invest in some new tools and capabilities to make this possible. So in looking at that, we have a variety of detection types that are available to us, the languages that we can speak uh, to our frontline defenders. We communicate in the form of very atomic detectors. So. Whenever you see this IP domain, hash value, whatever, bad stuff's happening. Yeah, that can be pretty binary. It's either good or it's not. It happened or it didn't. 
Um, very limited though, in a lot of functionality. So probably not as flexible as we'd like or need it to be in order to adapt with threats that evolve over time. But then we could get into behavioral items, similar to our complex example, where we're identifying characteristics in the telemetry that's available to us that match activity of interest. That requires more complex logic, which is going to get you a little bit further down the line in terms of identifying really interesting adversary tradecraft and activity, but at the cost of having to write more complex detectors and having to have the suitable environment and capabilities in order to actually apply them. More realistically, we're probably dealing with a composite uh, where we're combining different atomic and behavioral types in order to come up with examples like our complex detector of looking for PE file, un unknown network location with shady imports associated with it. This is where intelligence really needs to step in and identifying, okay, if I don't have the bandwidth necessarily to investigate all of these, or I don't have the visibility necessary to see all facets of intrusion activity, how can I cobble together from a combination of indicators, uh, indicator characteristics, as well as what glimpses of behavior I can get, wrap my hands around in order to put together something that then is impactful in the environment that I'm supporting and trying to defend. So in looking at this, we can split items down as far as detectors are concerned to the things that are environment driven, where we're looking for things like, okay, show me normal and what deviates from the baseline, like, okay, that's cool. That's data science. This is not a data, data science conference. I am not a data scientist. I am not going to go into that. It's, it's cool stuff or whatever. And there are vendors that will try to sell you that it will solve all your problems. We're not going there right now. Valuable, but within its own place. Instead, we're gonna talk about adversary driven mechanisms in order to build detections where we understand adversary operations and requirements and then identify observations associated with adversary actions in order to fuel our detector development process. That gets us into the realm of threat intelligence or threat intelligence deliverables that we can reasonably expect to have value for our frontline operator. So, okay, we've covered intelligence, we've covered detections. How do we start fusing these together in a reasonably effective fashion and doing this all in less than 30 minutes of talking time? Well, let's revisit our intelligence deliverables. So we research and understand adversary operations and do so in order to identify the mechanisms or artifacts of adversary behavior. What are the touch points that I can see within my visibility? You know, for maybe I only have network visibility, you know, NetFlow, DNS logs, and proxy logs. Like one, good luck. Two, uh, that's honestly not that far off from a lot of organizations. And so if that's what you're dealing with, you need to figure out a way to support that. Uh, in terms of not just what adversaries are doing, but how adversary operations would look in the telemetry that's available to you. And once we come up with that fusion between understanding what we can see and what adversaries are doing, we want to try to codify that knowledge of how to identify adversary operations into some sustainable, lasting fashion that can benefit our security teams. Let's go back to the intelligence cycle, because we haven't seen this like a dozen times today already, right? That's okay, it's there for a reason, it's important. Uh, the planning and direction, okay, we're not gonna really get into that so much, but certainly as a combination of early stages of the intelligence cycle, we wanna identify or have an understanding of what are the threats of interest and then begin researching and understanding their operations. That doesn't mean telling your SOC operator that it's like, well, this breakdown within Russia's GRU means that operational control passes to this general sitting in this office here. He doesn't care about that. Instead, it means understanding, like, what are the threats that actually face your organization? How do they operate? And how do I begin collecting information about how those adversaries might operate? That gets me to a point where I can start doing things like examining technical data, whether that's capturing samples of malware and running it in a sanitized and monitored environment to see what it does, looking at uh, incident analysis and intrusion analysis to figure out what adversaries are doing, and then picking out what are the touch points where adversary action starts coming to play for what I can do in my environment. Figuring out what are those observations or behaviors that are indicative of adversary actions that I could then inform my security team about. Then, I need to figure out what are my telemetry sources that could see this stuff. Uh, and this requires coming a little bit out of our shells a bit and understanding like, okay, if I work for big Fortune 50 financial institution that probably have all the bells and whistles and can do a whole lot, if I'm working for the 50 person machine shop that is maybe just doing some cloud logging or whatever and does M, you know, Office 365 and whatnot, I probably don't have that much visibility. In fact, they're probably not their only 
they're a security person. You're probably coming in once a week as an MSSP contractor or something to help them out. So you have very limited capability in order to really try to help them to see these sorts of things. But between those extremes, we need to identify, well, what are the possibilities that exist for identifying the behaviors we flagged as items of interest or high correlation to malicious operations and to get instances of those observations in front of a decision maker to reduce that mean time to detect and improve security response outcomes. Because ultimately, and you know, this is asking people to get a little hands-on and technical, we wanna to try to test identification mechanisms that we used in researching the threat and then try to codify them in such a way that they can be applied as detectors. That could mean some crazy Kibana query or whatever if you're using that environment. It could mean developing a Sigma or a Zeek script of some sort in order to identify these items, but figuring out like, okay, I just did a hell of a lot of work in order to try to figure out what an adversary is doing and to try to find them in the network. How do I make the organization or allow the organization to then benefit from that research? Yes, I could write a report about that. That's nice. Um, I can write a report about it and present it at a conference. That's even nicer, right? But if I really want to try and improve outcomes for the organization I'm defending, I probably want to get this in some fashion that it allows my responders to improve their outcomes, uh, whether that's by finding things earlier or figuring out how better to respond things or just getting more information about when and where adversaries are popping up within the monitored environment. So in looking with that, we're really talking about a seismic shift in terms of how intelligence aligns with security operations. Like you're not talking, you're, you're not sending Yara signatures to the CISO unless you have a very hands-on CISO, in which case that's probably uncomfortable. Um, I am sure there's exceptions, Rick. Um, anyway, um, but we're really shifting perspective from what I think is an overemphasis on strategic deliverables for intelligence to very tactical applications uh, that align very tightly with security operations centers, incident responders, uh, potentially threat hunters, if you're you know, well off enough in order to have that sort of capability in your environment. Uh, and that's shifting our conception of deliverables away from briefings and reports to technical observations and technical understanding of adversary activity that can fuel the detection engineering process. This is really cool in my opinion, because it means that we start fusing cyber threat intelligence from being a potential ivory tower functionality or whatever that is the ear of the board or whatnot, because we're telling you that the Russians are in the network or the Chinese or the North Koreans or whomever is the flavor of the week right now, uh, to instead getting really tied into SOC and IR operations in order to inform immediate security outcomes. It's not easy and it doesn't always work because either your telemetry is poor or other things go sideways. But now we're really talking about, you know, going to discussions of metrics, prove the value of threat intelligence. Well, threat intelligence assisted in the development of X number of detections that closed off these phases of the cyber kill chain or uh, a set, address these minor attack techniques, et cetera. And we're really talking about closing visibility and detection gaps and improving security outcomes through identifying malicious activity. Uh, so yeah, I already talked to this, so I don't need to belabor this point. Uh, you know, really making CTI relevant to SecOps beyond just like, oh, they wrote another report. Like, okay, well, again, reports are cool, but now we're talking about really fueling the life cycle of security operations in a way that immediately and directly benefits them. That gets us a closer relationship with forward-facing personnel and allows for opportunities of shortening the intelligence cycle. So we always talk about feedback as being important, but we never get enough of it. Well, if you're tied directly into security operations and you're either QCing, evaluating, or providing for the foundation of detectors in your environment, when those go wrong, you're gonna hear about it. So that feedback cycle is going to pretty much tighten up pretty quickly, as well as being able to see the relevance of those items and what advice has been given towards detecting and identifying threats within the monitored environment. But not all is roses and unicorns and whatnot. Uh, instead, we also have some drawbacks to this way of aligning very firmly with detection engineering. Uh, that could mean abandoning strategic views. We can only do so much. You know, we've talked about economics and trade-offs in previous presentations here. We can't do everything all the time, all at once. And so if we're taking a very operational focus to our intelligence activities, it means that we're probably abandoning some of our responsibilities or desired outcomes in the strategic space because we fundamentally changed audiences and that needs to be communicated effectively in order to avoid disappointment uh, or other items that may come back to haunt us. 
Uh, we also want to make sure that we're not completely losing track of long-term trends, challenges, and analysis by losing the forest for the trees, so to speak. Uh, we still need to do long-term trend analysis of attacker activity and tradecraft. And if we become too tightly wound up with the ransomware flavor of the minute and so forth, we won't get that perspective and the benefits that occur to it, such as identifying shifts over time from macro enabled documents to zipped ISOs and so forth for attacker methodology because we're so focused on the here and now. So like all things, only Sith deal in absolutes. And so you as threat intelligence analysts should not be doing so because you know, we are on the right side of the force, so to speak. Uh, but really effectively trying to figure out ways that we can continue to have some perspective on the overall threat environment while not abandoning or going so far in that direction that we lose sight of the very real and very immediate, uh, immediately beneficial outcomes that can be gained by ensuring tight threat intelligence integration with frontline security personnel as communicated through an intelligence informed detection engineering process. So the conclusion. Relevant secure intelligence informs security ops. Sounds like we all want to do that, right? But I don't know if we are really doing a good job of it right now. So there are ways that we can probably improve that. And this is one of them. Detection development represents a critical space for improving security outcomes, as well as enhancing significant security decision-making across the organization. By applying threat intelligence and threat intelligence principles to the detection research and engineering process, we can start providing not just effective ways to benefit the organization, but also very effective and powerful ways of showing the value intelligence brings to security. It's not just like, oh, uh, Karen over there in the cubicle in the corner or whatever, she wrote something up or whatever about the strategic support force and how that aligns with state-sponsored state -sponsored ransomware operations as a side job. Like, I don't know what to do with that. Rather, Karen helped analyze this malware sample and realized that we had gaps in our coverage that, were, that couldn't see, for example, uh, RPC calls for lateral movement within the environment, and they worked with one of our analysts in order to come up with a way of identifying this in our existing logging infrastructure. That's pretty cool. So, yeah, maybe moving a little bit out of our comfort zone from the strategic geopolitical space or whatever of intelligence analysis. But if you really want to sell your management that CTI is valuable, if you can prove that it's an enhancing immediate security outcomes and working hand in glove with your security operations center, incident responders, and similar probably going to be a much easier argument to, to make. So don't abandon these guys, folks, people, whatever. Um, and yeah, you know, do some research and detection development. 